curious RPG, Live Alive, is a fascinating time capsule of an era when RPGs were still experimenting heavily with structures and ideas, and its long-awaited remake proves that the best, weirdest efforts of that experimentation can still shine today. Its unusual story structure of seven different vignettes from different historical eras is immediately striking after decades of grandiose linear RPGs and is upheld by its ensemble cast of lovable characters. But what truly makes Live Alive a triumph is the way it pulls its disparate threads together to subvert expectations of JRPGs, not only as they existed in 1994 when it was first made, but somehow still almost three decades later in 2022. I understand, I truly do. But all good things must come to an end. Most of the best things about Live Alive's remake were present in its original form, which is all the more a shame it didn't make it to the West back in the 90s. That said, this remake would have been worth doing even if the whole world were already familiar with the story and the gameplay. While the original was not the prettiest of Square's RPGs even for its era, the HD 2D look pioneered by Octopath Traveler continues not to miss when it comes to wonderfully marrying sprite-based nostalgia with modern 3D capabilities. Live Alive is lovely, full of eye-catching color schemes and memorable snapshots where Square has used the depth of its 3D backgrounds to full effect. On the surface, Live Alive's seven vignettes are disconnected, and it largely doesn't matter which one you start or end with. Not only does each chapter take place in a different historical era, but they also distinguish themselves with unique characters, all fully voice acted. You who stand firm and resolute, declare yourself that all may know and cheer. And unique mechanics to suit them. In prehistory, for instance, the caveman Pogo can use his powerful sense of smell to track down the whereabouts of NPCs or enemies he's looking for. The Edo period shinobi Oboromaru can use stealth to hide from enemies and complete his entire chapter without killing a single human or he can brutally murder his way through the manner he's infiltrating. Near Future's Akira can read minds and teleport out of battle. <laughs> Though quite different from one another, Live Alive's ensemble cast all manage to endear themselves and their respective stories. I still can't pick a favorite. The unique flavors of each protagonist, era, and theme show up in battles, too. While all seven characters use the same grid system to move about the field and launch attacks at foes in turn-based combat, Live Alive manages to theme each protagonist's moves in ways that effectively reflect their personality. Oboromaru uses lots of area of effect abilities to lay traps on the field and force enemies to either move or take damage. The Sundown Kid has a gun, so everything he does is long range. Imperial China's Earthenheart Shifu Master can pass on battle techniques to his students as he trains them, while present day's Masaru Takahara learns martial arts moves from his enemies. Learning the ways in which each of the seven diverse characters can take advantage of the same battle system was one of Live Alive's great pleasures, and I was often impressed by the ways in which the marriage of combat and character either furthered the plot or told something interesting about a person I loved. Shut up already! Each chapter's enemies are designed around the respective character's unique abilities, and the deceptively simple grid system has plenty of tricks up its sleeves. The deeper I dug into each chapter, the more I was forced to reckon with the grid, not just as a means to get my attacks lined up, but also as a tool for predicting enemy moves and avoiding them so my team wasn't decimated. Don't underestimate Live Alive's battle system, especially if you want to go after the well-hidden handful of secret bosses scattered throughout several of its chapters. All of the battle and field mechanics play beautifully in the context of a given chapter, many of which lean gently, but not obnoxiously, into popular film, TV, and even gaming tropes. You might recognize the plot of Far Future from some popular science fiction films. Present Day is a clear homage to arcade fighting games, and Imperial China plays out like a stereotypical kung fu feature. I must use what time is left to me to find and train the disciple. Until suddenly they don't subverting the tropes they had previously embraced. Were Live Alive merely this, a collection of vignettes with loosely connected themes and clever subversions, I'd have walked away happy enough with my experience. But wonderfully, there's more. I don't 
want to spoil Live Alive for those who are unaware of its biggest twists from the original 94 Japan release, and if you're in that camp, I'm begging you to go in without looking it up. What I can tell you is this. As I played through these vignettes and reached their various endings, I quickly noticed a very obvious common thread between them, and expected that thread to reward me once I finished them all with something fairly obvious and RPG-like, an extra boss battle maybe, or a cutscene or two. What I got was a full 10 more hours of video game, on top of the 15 or so it had taken me up to that point, stuffed with several major twists, deeply emotional and triumphant moments, many secrets and side quests, and multiple endings depending on the choices I made throughout. My biggest issue with Live Alive, sadly, also lay in that second half. While most of the seven vignettes are fairly tight, concise stories, its final act is full of obnoxiously grindy random battles that slow its momentum significantly. While there was a certain amount of fighting I needed to do to face the final challenge, there was also a clear point at which grinding became trivial, and I was running from fights every 5 to 10 seconds or so. In Live Alive's defense, I do see how the excessive random battles are playing on a genre trope it otherwise very effectively subverts, but at a certain point that trope falls away and it's just exhausting. Which is a shame, because this segment was the part of Live Alive where I was consistently on the edge of my seat, wanting to know what would happen next. I don't think the excessive random encounters dramatically damaged my enthusiasm, but given how utterly ungrindy the first 15 hours are, it's certainly a frustration I'd recommend that you prepare yourself for, especially if you, like me, want to visit all the optional dungeons and explore all the secrets available in the late game. I can't forget to mention the excellent soundtrack by Yoko Shimomura of Kingdom Hearts fame and much more. Her original score for Live Alive was good on its own, and with modern audio capabilities and her own 2022 revisions, it's only gotten better. The boss theme, Megalomania, is rightfully remembered as being among her best works, and I've had the remake version playing on loop for days now. Live Alive is a fascinating piece of JRPG history that's more than worthy of the energy Square Enix has spent to remake it for a global audience with a beautiful new art style decades later. Its unusual vignette structure and lovable ensemble cast are a delight to spend time with, especially thanks to the addition of voice acting. Naming was never my forte. And the ultimate story payoff remains surprising and stand out among JRPGs even decades after its original iteration. Its seven different characters each make inventive and surprising use of the deceptively simple combat system, which adds flavor to the most challenging optional boss fights. The remake could have put a bit more work into mitigating some of the original's more tedious grinds toward the end, but by the time that grind kicks in, Live Alive had enough hooks stuck in me that I couldn't put it down until I jammed out to Megalomania for the final time. For more, check out our reviews of Octopath Traveler and Bravely Default 2. And for everything else, stick with IGN.